Hey, welcome back, everybody. It's time to pick up our weekly journey called Living Hope, designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer, sharing the real-life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how they deal with it on a daily basis. With someone, well, we've said it before, we'll say it again. She's dealt with it for a day or two. <laughs> and she's got some uh, unique uh, perspective on this that she's going to share along with her guest who has a unique program that she's teaching future physicians all about it. Welcome back, Roberta Luna and her guest. Thank you, Paul. I appreciate that. I'm glad to be back. And I'm really happy to have Melissa Roland Goldsmith back with us. Um, she was here about a year ago, and we got a lot of questions by some of the things she talked about. So I want to give her a chance to answer those, but since I can't do it. Um, Melissa is affectionately referred to by her students as Dr. RJ, RG. Sorry, um, Melissa is the Associate Pro Professor of Biological Sciences and Biochemistry and Molecular Biology <laughs> and Co-Director Center of Excellence in Training and Learning at Chapman University. That was a mouthful and I'm glad at least I got <laughs> I was able to say most of the words correctly. So thank you so much, Melissa, for joining us again. It's, it was great having you. I think it was almost a year ago or maybe it was a year a ago. A little over a year ago. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I guess, you know, um, having you on, people have come up with a lot of questions that they've asked me so we thought we'd take the opportunity and have you come back and let you answer those so I appreciate you, you coming much. back so you, can you just give us a brief summary of what when you were here the first time what we kind of talked about just to bring those people up to date a little bit how I got into becoming a pancreatic cancer researcher and professor and so uh, just briefly I was in in elementary school where I met somebody that actually had leukemia and unfortunately passed away and that was really the, my first connection with any kind of cancer and it was at that point I, I thought I wanted to be an MD but seeing this little girl lose her her life so young made me decide that maybe it would be something w a, a MD maybe an oncologist and then along the way I went to undergraduate work at Chapman University and it was a professor who took me aside because I was really like I said MD most likely oncology bound uh, as my specialty and she said uh, you really have a gift in you as a teacher educator and researcher why don't you consider this kind of career you'd be fine as an MD but I just want you to think about it and and as I thought this lady was crazy my whole <laughs> life I've been wanting to to become an MD and she's having me consider another path but I took a couple of years off and, and did uh, not cancer research, but did some microbiology kind of work after I graduated. And this crazy professor, not so crazy, was right. And uh, it was then my intent to return to a place like Chapman, become a professor myself, and teach students to become critical thinkers. And then I could do biomedical research, specifically cancer, and help my students that way as well. Yeah, I think it's kind of amazing how sometimes somebody can see something in us we don't see in ourselves. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that actually saw that I would enjoy doing <laughs> podcasts, hosting podcasts, which I thought, nope, no way for me, but here we all are. Um, I'm glad she saw that on you, and I still find it amazing that you knew as a child what you wanted to be, because a lot of us don't even know as an adult what we want to be, so I find that amazing, and I'm, as a survivor and as a caregiver, I'm very thankful that you chose the path that you did choose, so thank you. Right, well, I didn't even like the sight of blood, so when I was volunteering <laughs> at the hospital, it, it, it really made me realize what am I doing, but it, it was that I always wanted to help people, and I think as a child, you, you want to help people pretty much people just tell you become a physician nobody really tells you about so many other opportunities you can do in sciences to help people such as being a professor and doing the research and then as you, you see I go out into the community and um, bring my students and get very involved in um, learning from them as well and I think especially and I don't know if this was your case or not but being a woman did you find it any more difficult or did people say no 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 stick with the doctor rather than the researcher when I was in graduate school, really, that was the first time I had some issues being a woman. I was the only female in my class of roughly five that started the PhD program at the time in biochemistry. And um, 
when we would study for exams or actually get our exams back, the first two years you take classes and do research and then you finish up the classes and it's just all research. And so that first year, uh, some of the guys in the program were quite brutal and uh, would say things like, how could I have a better grade than they did? And I really had great preparation in learning how to be a critical thinker, as I said before, from my alma mater, Chapman University. And uh, so I came into graduate school with a really good handle on how to take those types of classes, these graduate level classes. And uh, so it was at a point where I, I, I almost considered just getting a master's and walking away because I just felt so threatened by these guys. But I knew that it was just going to be a matter of a couple years to be in classes and then we'd be on our own doing our own research and whatnot. And these guys ended up becoming friends of mine and, you know, it, it all worked out. But I did find a female mentor um, for my uh, for my graduate work because of what I was going through. Um, and I don't think I would have done that, sought out a female if, it, if I didn't have this kind of issue with these guys uh, threatening me with this, so. Yeah, well, maybe that was, sometimes we need that little kick to keep mm -hmm. us going, right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that you were able to continue, and it's nice that you guys are now friends, and mm -hmm. I think is great. You have a unique teaching style. Could you explain your style? Yes, I, with, I, I teach cancer biology. That has been a dream come true for me. So I started that about, I think we're now going into our fifth fifth year or sixth year. And I, I co-teach that with another professor. When we developed that course, it was my intent to teach the human side. So it wasn't just the molecular biology of cancer in general, but I also wanted to bring in the human side and let the students know that it's not just a bunch of cancer cells that have mutations and growing abnormally and spreading and whatnot, but it's the people who have these cancer cells growing in their body what are they going through? And then what are their caregivers and surrounding friends going through at the same time? So that was really important for me to bring the compassion in uh, cancer care within you know, my class classroom experience. And that's really, really unique compared to anybody else I know that teaches a cancer biology class at other institutions. So um, then I also teach a grad, an undergraduate senior level class that is an upper division molecular genetics lab. And when I designed that lab, I designed it to be a course-based undergraduate research experience. And I brought in my research from my own laboratory, which is in pancreatic cancer, into this laboratory setting. And so the students spend an entire semester doing research on this project um, in which we treat, I treated the cancer cells with a combination, a very odd and unique combination of natural products, pomegranate juice extract and um, caffeine. And so the students then end up uh, analyzing this big data set that I had produced for my experiment and they go in and do a computer-based, what's called bioinformatic analysis. So they, they sift or, or uh, data mine through all of this data to see different genes that were regulated by this treatment compared to cell pancreatic cancer cells that were not treated. And uh, they, they then identify a gene that is involved coding for a protein that is involved in hopefully slowing down the cancer. And so then they spend the rest of the semester validating that original finding. So um, it's really, really exciting for the students. In fact, one time we did bring in uh, pre-COVID times cancer survivors, pancreatic cancer survivors and caregivers to come see our student success and see their presentations at the end of the, the, the research project. So, um, so they really do enjoy that. And then, like I said, my separate course, the cancer biology, um, we, it's all, everything I do is critical thinking. So that, that's the first thing, whether it be my, my lower division classes through my senior level, it's always about critical thinking, but it's also for me bringing this human side, especially to my upper division classes. And I, I, I find that really interesting, but I want to know why did you want to give the human side to this? Uh, when and this this was part of my last podcast when I was a researcher as postdoc in Dr. Murray Quirk's lab at UC Irvine, I was probably 
four or five years into my research, and it was me working with cancer cells. It was me working with cancer cells that I uh, created uh, pancreatic cancer tumor models in uh, mice with my cancer cells, and and there was something missing four or five years into it, and it was, who am I trying to help? It was just me get collecting data. And so one day, Murray, Dr. Murray Cork told me about a pancreatic cancer walk here in Irvine. I went to this walk. I was the only one from my group that did attend, and I wanted to go and meet people that had the disease. I wanted to meet the caregivers. I, I needed that for myself. And once I did find that, I knew that I couldn't keep it hidden. Uh, when I had my own research students working with me, I would require them to start going to different walks and events, going to symposiums where there's survivors and caregivers, because I know for me it fueled my interest in wanting to do more by meeting and getting to know the patients of who I'm trying to help. And so then in my upper division classes, um, it went beyond my research students and into my class, and I wanted all of my students to also um, find that interest in getting to know. So when my students end up going into research as a career or if they go into becoming a medical care provider, it is my hope and intent that they too will continue doing what they did in this class and if they are studying pancreatic cancer that they would, for example, continue to go to uh, different pancreatic cancer walks and, and be spokesperson uh, for uh, some of these walks and, and just get to know the people so that it keeps them going and makes it real. Yeah, I've been um, privileged to be part of the group that's been able to go and listen to your students, and I always find it really amazing. I know I, I'm really a poor grader because I give them all A's because I think for them to have the guts for one to get up there and do that because it's, it's very difficult. Um, to the things they presented, but it's been awesome. And I look at them thinking one of them is going to be the one that's going to come up with either the cure, the early detection, or some way that's going to take out my tumor and, and, mm -hmm. and move on. So I think you're doing a fantastic yeah, so, job. Yeah. So for, for that class that you're talking about, I've really created a, a unique approach uh, where the first two years I taught the class, I asked the students, again, I wanted to bring in the human side, so we did bring in survivors, and you have been to my class every single year, <laughs> even during COVID times via Zoom, but uh, we brought in survivors and caregivers for students to first meet them and hear their stories, and then um, I had the students try to do a presentation. The first year was without any patients, but I just said, please present as if there are a group of non-experts in the audience listening to you. And it was awful. The students had no idea what to do, and they used tons of scientific jargon. The next year, I met Dr. Mark Gerges at UCLA at a Hirschberg Foundation meeting, and uh, he invited, uh, uh, he volunteered to work with me and my students. So he gave me a couple of his papers that I had my students read, and then we met him all at the LA Cancer Challenge, uh, the Hirschberg Walk. And after the walk, we all sat outside on the steps of Royce Hall going over his papers. And he was able to model science communication for my students. And so now they fully understood the paper and then they were supposed to bring it down to a level that non-experts could understand. That year we did bring in survivors and caregivers. You were actually there. And it still wasn't great because I still did not teach my students how to effectively communicate. It was at that point that I said something's missing and that's me not doing that job of helping them really learn the skills um, or art of science communication. So at that point I um, was able to take a class by the American Society for Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, better known as ASBMB, and they have an online course called The Art of Science Communication. So I took that course, and then I was able to become the instructor of that course for my students, and I blended that course into my cancer biology. So my poor cancer biology students <laughs> take the intense molecular biology class and they have nine, uh, roughly seven to nine additional outside classes um, via Zoom where we are teaching, and I, I now bring my former students to help me teach that um, uh, art of science communication. So they, we still have the students read Dr. Gerges's papers. Now we also have brought in Dr. Murray Cork, my, my 
former postdoc at UCI and we read a paper or two of his. The students are required to then read these papers, choose one figure from one of those papers of their choice, and then they spend the rest of this class learning how to effectively communicate and then take that particular figure and create a five-minute presentation without showing PowerPoint slides. There's, they can use props, and they're very creative in using props if they want, as you know, but they cannot use PowerPoint, and they cannot show the real data. So they have to learn how to use storytelling and use analogies to describe these complex scientific words. And um, when they do the presentation, they actually have, I, I bring in the survivors and caregivers, and they help evaluate my students, as you just said. And I take the average of all of the grades, um, including myself and my colleague. And it's just been an amazing journey to see the students take this project so seriously because they know they want to do a good job. They want, it's not about a grade, it's about making you all understand the science and teach you something new. So that's been a, a really neat project. And um, then I've even brought in a new project in my class where I match students each with a survivor, a various cancer survivor, and they are to do two different Zoom sessions. The first one, they meet about um, the, the person's personal story of survival of their cancer, and that person is to tell them something, two or three different things that they wish their doctor did or what their doctor did right to help my student learn how to be more compassionate uh, whether as a researcher or as a physician. And then the student takes all that they learn from the class. This is the end of the semester project. They take everything they learn and they use the art of science communication training plus their hardcore molecular biology training to teach about one hallmark of cancer to the, to the survivor. And they create all kinds of teaching um, demonstrations, uh, power. In this case, they can use PowerPoint, but it has to be, again, without using scientific jargon. And it's, um, it's life changing for these students. They've, some of them have kept in touch with their match participant over the years. This is the, I've completed this project now two years. I started that during the heart, uh, the height of the pandemic. And so that's been really a special project for our students. Yeah, I know, uh, like you said, some of them have used props and whatnot, and they, it, a lot of times it's actually made me understand things better. I know one time they were using the leaky faucet, which mm -hmm. really brought it to mind and made it easy, and in another group you had where they wore t-shirts, and it was just really cute. Mm -hmm. So the way they've done it has been really educational, even for you know someone like me who I thought had heard it all. But when they were explaining some things, it finally something finally clicked in a couple of times when, you know, the doctor explains it, but I still wasn't quite getting it. And in their explanation, I'm like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense now. So they're doing a great job. And what do they feel about it? I mean, are they enjoying the class? Or do they love it? It's, oh, they love they... it. Yeah, they all have told me for both classes that these are just like I said, life changing and. Um, it's, we don't get a lot of students that will take this uh, elective, the cancer biology class, because it is a lot of work. I mean, now they do get a certificate of completion from this society of ASBMB for completing the art of science communication. So that's a little added prize, if you will, that they can put on their CV, but they're not taking it for that. They're taking it because they want to learn that science communication and they want to learn molecular biology behind cancer. They want to know it all. And so, you know, we just keep giving them more and more work and they keep taking it. They do not complain about it um, because they are just learning so much and, and love meeting with all of you. They love meeting with Dr. Cork, Dr. Gerges, and other research scientists. So it's just been a, a really fascinating class and, and the, the research class too. The students, some of them had never done research before and they said, wow, research is really creative. And I've actually had a couple students who were MD bound decide to take a year or two gap year, kind of like I did to kind of reevaluate, maybe this is my path that I want to go into. Yeah, well, they seem like so when they give their presentations, they really seem like they're enjoying it. And um, they've been very, like you say, creative in getting the point across, and it's really appreciated. How did Chapman and how did your colleagues uh, react to you wanting to do this? And were they 
hopefully supportive? Oh, or yes, have, they've been, you, yeah, 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 yeah. They've been very supportive. Um, my colleague, uh, when I came up with the crazy idea for the, the most recent thing of having <laughs> the match participant, um, I had to do it all, but he was extremely supportive of this idea. And um, yeah, and then uh, m my my chair, or well, we don't have chairs, but my program director, I mean, everybody just really finds that this experiential learning is really the way to go. I mean, because we're, we're providing the, the hardcore, like I said, molecular biology, the, the research, we are reading primary articles, major critical thinking, but um, it's just so innovative to be bringing in, like I said, this compassion in, in, in medical care, this uh, science of compassion into the classroom. Um, everybody has just been really supportive and it is my hope that other classes maybe it's not a more medical oriented science class but maybe it's an environmental science class that they too can start bringing in stakeholders to their student presentations and and have a, a bit more experiential learning and i do know that within um some of the sciences there is some experiential learning going on where they go out to the field sites and things like that so People are very much embracing what we're doing, what I'm doing. Do you see maybe other universities copying or asking you maybe to help them out to get this program going? Interesting you ask that. So I uh, became um, involved with the same society, ASBMB. I, a year ago, I became a member of the Science Outreach and Communication Committee within ASBMB, um, or called the SOOC Committee. And uh, within that committee, we have subcommittees, and guess what subcommittee I got put on? The Art of Science Communication. So we are the committee that actually puts on this course. So we've actually been working this past year in rewriting the scripts for that course and kind of modernizing it and um, uh, we're getting ready to roll out the new that the new course uh, in the in, in springtime uh, and so it's been really exciting and part of that course again it's a standalone course for people like postdocs grad students anybody in the world could take that course because it's online um, I mean, it is synchronous, meaning they have meetings once a week for the seven or nine week period, and then asynchronous where they do watch videos and do homeworks and things like that. Um, but they have been really, really excited, the society, uh, in having me there because of what I've been doing in blending this class into my existing undergraduate course. Uh, and they want to, to have me be able to help show other faculty members at other universities how they too can blend in this course into existing undergraduate courses because again this is really really unique to bring um, science communication uh, into an undergraduate course you, you you are lucky if you get to have this type of course in graduate school and I'm happy to say that many graduate schools are starting to do more of that not all and um, you know in me medical schools um, some are doing this some aren't so um, so it's really neat to be able to have the undergraduates have this experience so early on and be able to take from that experience and and continue to learn and grow and be most importantly effective communicator communicators whether they are researchers physicians or so somehow in the medical field yeah a lot of your students have said that your course helped them to pre prepare for graduate or professional schools how how has that helped them prepare for that again being critical thinkers number one um, they can read a paper tear it apart and understand it based on the way that um, the way I teach the course it's not me just standing there and lecturing but they, uh, for example, they just went through an activity reading an, in my cancer biology class, a paper from 1982 it was one of the first papers that uh, identified the famous KRAS um, mm -hmm. and how it became an oncogene or, you know, a bad gene, one that um, is not a cause of pancreatic cancer, but a gene that is dysregulated in many, many people with pancreatic cancer. And so they uh, read this paper, but we zoomed in on one particular figure, which was a crazy figure, took up an entire page, <laughs> and the methods were gigantic. And I had the students go through and cartoon all of the methods to create that particular figure. 
and um, they were able to do it. They're seniors, and they were able to take what they learned from my original undergraduate class, an intro to molecular genetics, as well as all of, as my wonderful colleagues who continue to teach them critical thinking, and they were able to take this and make sense of it and identify how this normal KRAS became this oncogene, identify the actual mutation that, that led to it being um, this oncogene. And so they are really proud of themselves. So doing that, when they go on to graduate school, then they have no problem, mm -hmm. just like I had no problem when I went on to grad school because of the critical thinking. So um, getting into grad school, though, being able to put on this art of science communication course, that the certificate, really sets them apart from the masses and um, that's on their resume or CV. Sometimes they discuss this in their letter of intent for graduate school. So when they go on to have uh, interviews for graduate or medical school, quite often they are asked about this class and my students always tell me that they think this is a reason why, uh, not, not the only reason, but this certainly helped them actually get in. And then once they're in, they just feel so prepared with the science communication, you know, when they have to give presentations, they use those skills all of the time. Yeah. Well, I think, again, I want to thank you because I think you're doing an awesome job and I've been so proud to be a small part and be able to see the change from the first few that I did to what you're doing now and you're doing an excellent job and I just want to thank you for coming back and answering some questions that were posed to me by people that have watched or listened to the previous when you were here a year ago. And I want to thank you for doing that and just you're doing an awesome job. So thank you for being here. And as we leave today, it's as long as you speak my name, I shall live forever. Today's Living Hope is dedicated to Sandra Mack. Sandra died on September 8th and was the kind of person who would help anyone, anytime, in any way she could. Sandra was a 10-year pancreatic cancer survivor, the outreach chair for the PanCan uh, Columbus affiliate. Sandra, you are greatly missed. And our deepest condolences to her daughter, son, and all her family and friends and the Columbus affiliate. So thank you. Well, there you have it. Another reason to tune in each and every time to our unique journey that we call Living Hope. A show provided, designed to provide hope, inspiration, and education for those living with pancreatic cancer, like we talked about today sharing the real life stories of those really affected by this deadly disease and how they deal with it. If you know somebody that is dealing with it and would like to share the story, please contact us by all means here at OC Talk Radio. And if you or anyone you know needs help, like right now, lots of resources. We had the Hirschberg Center on last week. Today we'll plug PanCan again, 877, the number two P-A-N-C-A-N, for the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network. Lots of places to get information. And we hope one of them is this show. So we invite you to join us each and every week as we continue to show the stories and people on this journey. Streaming live from our studios here at the University of California, Irvine's Beale Applied Innovation Center.